So Game Porting Toolkit just got its very first update and the results are very surprising. Not only do we get pretty huge improvements in some specific Apple Silicon chips, but game compatibility has also expanded tremendously. We now have a bunch of graphical performance and stability improvements and features that have been removed but have been added back to the Game Porting Toolkit. So if you didn't already know, Game Porting Toolkit is a new method of running Windows DirectX 11 and 12 games on Apple Silicon hardware. However, this is very much much a developer tool only. It's really designed for developers to help evaluate how much work it would take to port their Windows DirectX game to the Mac. However, us Mac gamers have been using it very recently to play advanced DirectX 12 games, and none of us were really sure whether this would actually get an update. After all, the first release of this tool has been pretty unApple like So the Windows translation layer requires building using terminal and a whole bunch of command lines. It kind of felt like this has all just been thrown together because if you are a developer, then you already know what to do to debug your game to get it to work through this translation layer. And it's also a similar deal with Game Porting Toolkit Beta 1.0.2. Again, we download the DMG and open it. However, when we get to the window, it still says that it's called Game Porting Toolkit 1.0, which is obviously a little bit confusing, but not the end of the world. And the next thing is that we have installation instructions, but we don't have upgrade instructions. Personally, I found that the simplest way to do this is to do a brew update and and then a brew upgrade within the command line interface. And then that will upgrade us straight to the latest version. Just remember to also ditto install the new library files as well. And if you're using Crossover and CX Patcher, then just download the latest game porting toolkit, make sure that it's mounted and then loaded as an external resource within CX Patcher, then drag and drop Crossover into the CX Patcher window. And you'll know whether game porting toolkit has been updated because we can look at the Rosetta line here and there's a new section which says V0.2. So this means we're using the newer version of Game Porting Toolkit because the original does not have that numbering. So now we're running the new version. The next question is what has actually changed? So there is no actual published change log, so we might be left guessing. Interestingly, you see that the new version is actually nearly half the size of the 1.00 release. And it's clear that there have been a lot of changes within the toolkit internally within the file structure. However, if you happen to be checking out the social media of Nat Brown, who is an engineering manager at Apple responsible for the Game Porting Toolkit, You'd see his latest tweet here where he says that they didn't have time to add change logs before the holiday weekend. However, they have added fixes for 32 bit support, rendering and performance improvements, and overall stability. So, firstly, let's talk about performance improvements. So, here I've got the original Game Porting Toolkit 1.00 release on the left and 1.02 released on the right. So, this is the game Elden Ring running on the M1 Max chip at 1080p on low. We're getting around four or five more FPS on average with the GPTK 1.02. Now performance in this game is not particularly great, but just remember that we're running through three translation layers. These include Windows to macOS, x86 to ARM64, and DirectX to the Metal Graphics API. And anyway, in this instance, it's great to see a little bit of improvement. 4 or 5 FPS represents about 20%. So not every game is going to see performance improvements. In fact, many do not. For example, Arkham Knight here pretty much runs identically whether we're running on GPTK1 or or GPTK 1.02. However, we see the biggest improvements when I'm doing my testing on the M2 Ultra chip. So this is Cyberpunk 2077 running at 1080p low and the performance isn't particularly great. However, it is far, far better than it used to be on the original GPTK 1.00. And we're seeing at least a doubling of the frame rate running on the Ultra chip. Now this isn't actually even close to what the M2 Ultra should be capable of graphically with Cyberpunk 2077. That's because I can run this on my M1 Max chip at 1440p at medium and still get a frame rate that's higher than the M2 Ultra at 1080p low. So it's likely that this is some kind of threading issue to do with M1 Ultra and M2 Ultra chips because of the fact that they are composed of two Max chips which are fused together using Ultra Fusion. In theory, given the number of GPU cores the M2 Ultra has, we should be seeing at least 50 60 fps at 1080p low however it's nice to see that there is an improvement even though there's a lot left on the table still and similar to cyberpunk 2077 hogwarts legacy also receives about a 5 fps performance boost and also Elden Ring as well. So it's nice to see some improvement on the Ultra chips. However, just remember that these are outliers. These games actually perform much better on cheaper Macs. 
So next up is Horizon Zero Dawn, and this is one of the most requested games. And now we've managed to get it working on Apple Silicon hardware. So previously on Game Porting Toolkit 1.00, there were some crazy graphical color artifacts on screen. And also we couldn't get the game running without this slow-mo effect. So the frame rate was actually very good still, but everything felt like it was running through treacle. So here's somebody's reported that it's possible to fix this issue by going into the registry editor and going to this value here. I'll leave a link in the description for this fix, as well as a batch script which fixes this problem. So the synchronization isn't quite perfect, some of the dialogue doesn't feel correct. If anyone figures out the exact megahertz value we need to change the registry editor to, then please let me know in the comments. But otherwise, the gameplay itself feels solid and smooth, even running under DirectX 12 at 1080p on ultra settings. So next up is an undocumented fix for Media Foundation, which is basically a set of video and audio codecs. Previously, this would cause some games to just crash when it tried to play an in-game cinematic or video, mostly because because the correct codecs weren't brought in to Wine. However, 1.02, it looks like we have upgrades to GStreamer and the Media Foundation codecs. This means that we can finally get games like Resident Evil 2 Remake to work on Apple Silicon hardware through Game Porting Toolkit. And it's been reported that other games also work in the series, including Resident Evil 7. Also, we can get games working like Devil May Cry 5, which did work fine on version 1.00. However, when you go to the item customization screen, then the game would crash because it would be trying to load a video. However, the game now plays pretty much flawlessly on version 1.02, all thanks to the Media Foundation GStreamer fixes. So just be aware that if you're using the CX patcher method of running game porting toolkit 1.02, then at the time of recording, this doesn't support the GStreamer fixes yet. However, the developers are working on this and could be released in the very near future. So lastly, we have the reintroduction of 32-bit support. So we've always been able to play 32-bit games on Apple Silicon Macs using crossover or wine. However, when Apple integrated wine into Game Porting Toolkit, for some inexplicable reason, they just decided to remove 32-bit support entirely. And I think the reason they might have done this is because 32-bit games do not play nicely with Rosetta 2 or the ARM64 chip. Codeweavers had to do some magic in order to get 32-bit games to work on the platform at all. And there are some pretty big overheads to running games this way. So here I'm running Fallout New Vegas, and the performance is pretty bad. It's actually way worse on the M2 Ultra than say on my M1 one max. Also, the game isn't running through Metal at all, it's using Wine D3D. But we're not really taking advantage of Apple's D3D Metal or any of their performance improvements that they've created. So anyway, it's really interesting that Game Porting Toolkit 1.02 has so many fixes and improvements, which happen to also benefit Mac gamers and not just the intended audience of potential Mac game developers. Apple are asking that if you see graphical glitches or unusual performance or input problems, then you should leave feedback because that's what Apple wants to know about. But really, at the end of the day, Apple really just want to get game developers to evaluate the game using Game Porting Toolkit. Then if this happens to fix issues with Mac games, then it's really just an accidental byproduct of Apple's intentions. Anyway, I can't wait to see what happens with future updates of Game Porting Toolkit. Let me know what you think is your favorite feature. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.